In Fulton Sheehan's famous uh, Life of Christ, chapter 3 is called The Three Shortcuts from the Cross. It's about the temptations of Christ in the desert after his baptism in the Jordan. It's the gospel for the first Sunday of Lent, the next Sunday. So a few short notes about this episode in our Lord's blessed life. The Archbishop points out that the temptation was not so much for our Lord, not one of giving in or giving over to the pleasures or temptations of the flesh, to gluttony, power, greed. Rather, the temptation for him was to abandon his divine mission. And if you think that he could not in his human nature be tempted thusly, simply remember the agony in the garden. He genuinely struggled with, if it be possible, let this chalice pass from me. As an aside here, and I think it's an important aside, touch on a theme that we bring up from time to time. The agony lasted while our Lord struggled with this question. If it be possible, let this chalice pass from me. That's what the word agony means. It's a Greek word meaning struggle or anguish. It was only when Jesus finished that thought, and we know how it ends, not my will, but thine be done. Only when he finished that was there peace. The agony ended, and his passion began. Passion is from a Latin word meaning to suffer. But suffering does not mean the same thing as agony, struggling, anguish. One can suffer in peace. That's not the case with agony. Agony implies a lack of peace. And the point is, very often, we are the source of our own misery. We make ourselves miserable by choosing to struggle with what is, rather than accepting what is. We remain in agony, rather than simply accepting, not my will, but thine be done. Only when we resign ourselves to the will of God, embracing what is and stop struggling, will we have peace. It doesn't mean we give up, but then we can begin our suffering, and our suffering will have merit. We will suffer. Nobody gets through this life without suffering. For by suffering we are proven. By suffering we are strengthened. By suffering is the glory of God made manifest in us. For then is our weakness laid bare, and his strength and the glory shine forth. Suffer we will, but suffering and peace are not exclusive of each other. Agony and peace are exclusive of each other. We cannot be both in agony and at peace. It's a useful tip for Lent. Don't struggle with your sacrifices. That just turns it into agony. and You'll be miserable. Just make the sacrifice. Accept the fact, this is what I'm doing. And suffer you will in some fashion, but you will not be miserable. So back to the temptations in the desert. Truly our Lord was tempted. Tempted to turn from his divine mission. Tempted to be another kind of a savior. Quoting from Archbishop Sheen, Only by carrying the cross can one reach the resurrection. It was precisely this part of our Lord's mission that the devil attacked. The temptations were meant to divert our Lord from his task of salvation through sacrifice. Instead of the cross as a means of winning the souls of men, Satan suggested three shortcuts to popularity, an economic one, another based on marvels, and a third which was political. The temptations of man, says the archbishop, are easy enough to analyze because they always fall into one of three categories. They either pertain to the flesh, lust and gluttony, or to the mind, pride and envy, or to the idolatrous love of things, greed. When Satan tempts, he uses what will most appeal to the one he is attempting. He already knew that there was something extraordinary about our Lord, at least that he was extraordinarily good and extraordinarily close to God. And so his temptation would have to appeal to that, how to please God, but at the same time in his human nature not have to suffer. How could he best fulfill his high destiny among men? The problem was to win souls. But how? Satan had a satanic suggestion namely to bypass the moral problem of guilt 
and its need of expiation, and to concentrate purely on worldly factors. All three temptations sought to woo our Lord from his cross and therefore from redemption, for there is no redemption without sacrifice. The first temptation to turn stones into bread was not about feeding himself. It was about solving the problems that people face. It was about becoming the kind of a natural savior who would be loved by everyone, not just a few. To save his life by this trivial use of his power, and if he succeeded in feeding the masses, that is, if he solved the troubles of their puny lives, they would extol him as a king and a man of God. Sure, the temptation to fill his belly made this temptation even greater because he knew what a consolation, what a comfort it would be to have food at that point. But what would that, what would that accomplish? It's built only on the weakness of men. And with the next generation, the corruption, the complaints will just come back. This temptation to be a material savior, to win men over simply by giving them things, giving them stuff, even if it's food, it would have spared him the cross. And he could not accept that. For there is no resurrection without the cross, and it was the resurrection, our rebirth, that he came for. This is a serious problem in the world today. People want salvation without suffering. So they have created religions to their liking or disposed of any religion that admits of the natural order of things, that natural order being that there is no salvation without suffering. And what was our Lord's response to this temptation? Not by bread alone does man live, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. That is, there are more important things than the material even more important than food. There is no redemption without addressing first those things, those immaterial things, those spiritual things, the salvation of man's soul before his body. And if the trouble of man's souls are addressed, then food is not really so significant in the redemption. It meant also that Christ, if he was to be Christ, could not put aside the word of God for him. He could not deviate from the path that was chosen for him. That path was to suffer and to die. And he could not take any other path for the salvation of man. For deviating from the will of God, that path would then in fact not be for the salvation of men. So here we are going into Lent. What can we see thus far? Do we prolong our agony by not embracing the will of God, by not admitting reality as it is. Maybe it's not pleasant, but we can never profit from that situation unless we accept that situation. Until we do, we cannot address it. If it means entering into our passion, a suffering, that's fine. At least in suffering, we can make a difference. We can be at peace. Agony is productive of nothing and costs us our peace. Embrace the cross so that you can rise from the dead, that the suffering may have a purpose and so that it will come to an end, a glorious end at that, a joyful end. Don't complain about your Lenten sacrifices, not even to yourself. You're just making an agony out of your suffering. And what else? By our Lord's reply to Satan in the first temptation, we're told plainly that the material suffering and the material success have much less to do with our redemption and salvation and our happiness than does the state of our soul and our relationship with God. And so again, until we are united to the will of God, whatever that will of God may be for us, pleasant or unpleasant in our lives, my marriage is difficult, my health is really difficult, my job stinks, I really miss those candy bars during Lent. Whatever it may be, until we accept reality as it is, then we cannot be united to the will of God, and we cannot make a difference against those things that make us miserable. This is useful as we enter Lent. It allows us to shift our focus from the difficulty that our penances may cause us so that when we are suffering... We can recall our Lord's words and say to ourselves, this is not really what it's all about. This suffering is nothing compared to the great good that I am doing for my soul. 
How much good I do my soul by suffering such trivial little things as physical penance. As the Archbishop reminds us in relation to the temptation to to turn stones to bread, he says, bread there must be. But remember, even bread gets all its power to nourish mankind from God. Bread without God can be harmful to a man. And there is no real security apart from the word of God. If Jesus give bread alone, then man is no more than an animal and dogs might as well come first to the banquet. Those who believe in Christ must hold to that faith, even when they are starved and weak, even when they are imprisoned and scourged. So quickly now, going over the second temptation. Satan's second attempt to get our Lord to veer from his cross rather than go to go the long and tedious path of teaching disciples, of fasting and penance, of betrayal and torture and death. He says, no, rather, work wonders. Astonish the people. Get them to follow you by being a wonder worker. Cast yourself down from the pinnacle of the temple, for surely the angels will bear you up. Gain everyone's admiration and loyalty by doing the spectacular. And is that not us in our spiritual lives at times? We want results and we want them now. But we're disappointed and discouraged when we have to work for progress. Lent itself is only a few weeks. And even if we do well for those few weeks, there is still the rest of the year. And we're told that we should be advancing in holiness and growing in virtue all the time. But it hurts. It means suffering. There are very few instant success stories in the biographies of the saints. And again, it's simply fidelity to the will of God. It's more important than grasping at the goal. If we could achieve the goal without the path that God has chosen for us, even so, we should not. God asked his son to do this thing in a very difficult way. And so the end and the means are both chosen by the Son. He's going to do the thing as well as he can, and he will not be diverted from it. To be a Savior who does not suffer, to be a Redeemer who has not spent himself, is to be less than the heroes of renown whom we so much admire. If Christ accepted Satan's offer to become a Messiah by spectacular signs and wonders, then signs and wonders would what man would want and would hold up as admirable and look for nothing more than bigger and better wonders and marvels. And that would be harmful, for that is not what man is made for. Man is made for love. And how does a Messiah of the spectacular show us love? If he won us by marvels and and not by suffering, men through the centuries would be able to say, but it cost him nothing. So in our spiritual lives too, also in Lent, we're not to look for marvelous leaps in virtue or holiness, to decide in one moment that we will no longer fall victim to this vice or commit that sin and expect that in the very next moment we will just be that way. We will be over it. That is to deprive ourselves and God of the proof of our love. It is also to set ourselves up for very great disappointment. The easy gifts are not worth so much. Imagine taking a year to paint a beautiful picture to give to someone very special as a gift. How precious that would be. And compare that to, be, to clicking on buy now on eBay. Not worth very much. I don't care how much you paid. The painting still costs more. Finally, the last temptation, to compromise. All these will I give thee, if falling down thou wilt adore me. Jesus came to be the Savior and King of all men, and Satan was promising to deliver all men into his hands, if only he would fall down and adore Satan. A quick bypass to the difficult path that he, that he had to come. Why suffer, slave, and die to win men when right here and now they could all be delivered for next to nothing? Because to do it would violate the law of God 
and the law of the universe. God is to be adored and God only. Jesus saith to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, The Lord thy God shalt thou adore, and him only shalt thou serve. So then the Savior, the Redeemer, the King would have to bow down to someone else. Would men be satisfied bowing down to a Savior who himself bowed to another? I think in this way we're all a little bit like St. Christopher. We're not going to settle for second best when it comes to worship. We don't want to settle for second best. See, St. Christopher in his service to the devil noticed that his master always avoided the sign of the cross, always gave a wide berth to crosses and to shrines. He understood then that there was one greater than his master, someone mightier than his master, one whom his master feared. And so Christopher sought out a holy man who could explain to him the cross and its power, a man who bowed to none but the true God. There is no room for compromise in the service of the Lord. And how we live this principle during Lent will determine what sort of Lent we have. When we make the sacrifice, do we really turn from the thing we're giving up? Do we really make a clean break? Or do we find ways of compensating ourselves? Silly little things. Oh, I hope we're giving up more in our penances for Lent than cream and sugar in our coffee. But let's imagine I'm giving up cream and sugar in my coffee. But you know, Splenda is not really sugar and doesn't taste as good as sugar anyway, so it's still a sacrifice, right? Yeah, if we're going to muck around in the world like this and not make a clean break, then we've already admitted the principle. It's not God alone, after all. We'll make a sacrifice as long as it doesn't cost us too much. And we make ourselves miserable by prolonging the agony rather than just making a clean break. Venial sin is a turning away from cre- turning towards creatures. Not yet a turning away from God, but a turning towards creatures. And a million venial sins don't equal a single mortal sin, but they certainly dispose us towards it. And we have compromised. We have admitted the premise, God is not first. Though he gave everything to me and for me, I'm not giving him my all. Oh, I'm going to wear those clothes that are just a little immodest. Or I'm going to check out that woman who's just a little immodest. Well, there's a slippery slope that does not take very long to get to the bottom of. Oh, but Father, it's not so bad. Isn't it only a venial sin? Well, first of all, when we're talking about that particular topic, it's quite possibly not just a venial sin. But second of all, so what if it were? Only a venial sin. Great. It's only the second greatest evil in the universe. But we can still get to heaven with venial sin, right? Right. But presumption is not a venial sin. And even if you get to heaven because you had only venial sin, I'm sure you'll be singing a different tune while you're waiting to get in from from purgatory. But finally, if the attitude is that a little compromise is okay, that we can still pass the test, still make it to heaven with venial sin or deliberate imperfections, then we're in grave danger of violating the great commandment. It is a commandment, remember. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with thy whole heart, with thy whole soul, and with thy whole strength. I think whole means whole. When you give something up for Lent, give it up, period. Quit mucking around with compromises, trying to find ways to console ourselves. Accept the suffering and don't turn it into an agony. A few of the lessons then from our Lord's temptation in the desert. First, there is no success worth counting unless there is spiritual success. Second, there are no shortcuts to holiness. It requires perseverance. He that shall persevere to the end shall be saved, Matthew 24, 13. And third, there is no compromise. 
When God says, with thy whole heart and with thy whole soul, with all thy strength and all thy mind, he does not mean that we may give part of ourselves to something else, as long as we give just what we have to, to God. For what we really have to give to God is, in fact, everything. Little Therese says it all just so very well. She says, you cannot be half a saint. You must be a whole saint or no saint at all. So Lent, spiritual success is what matters. Who cares about a little penance? Who cares about a lot of penance? Spiritual success is what matters. Persevere to the end and no compromise. The grace is there in this holy season. We just need to stay fixed on the goal. And the goal is to become a saint, not half a saint, but a whole saint. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen.